Welcome, welcome everyone. So nice to see everyone. Today we will start our panel presentation by reading the poem Rise. And we'll have our PowerPoint slide up here in just a second. But in the meantime, Rise, the poem is by two climate activists who are also indigenous women. Um, we will be framing our panel presentation with this poem before and after our project introductions. <clears throat> Sister of ocean and sand, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, to the land where they sacrificed their lives to make mine possible, to the land of survivors. Sister of eyes and snow, I offer you this shell and the story of the two sisters as testament, as declaration, that despite everything, we will not leave. Instead, we will choose to stay. We will choose to be rooted in this reef forever. We ask, we demand that the world see beyond their SUVs, ACs, their prepackaged convenience, their oil slick dreams beyond belief that tomorrow will never happen, that this is merely an inconvenient truth. Let me bring my, my home, home to, to yours. yours. From the borderland region, the majestic Chihuahuan Desert and the Rio Grande, I welcome you to my home of dreamers, to a community so diverse as a desert itself, to a region that gives you a sense of identity with strange and unique beauty, to a place working to protect land with all of its people behind it, regardless of their zip codes or the size of their dreams. From the Philippines to Denver and then Seattle, I welcome you to my world of nonprofit operations and storytelling of seed sovereignty movements in the Philippines, where my virtual world meets on the ground climate advocacy work through seed saving, delivering to you all a podcast framework, annual reports, and graphic design. From the hillsides of Amhara to the mountains of Colorado, I welcome you to sit and rest. The sea of red you see is normal. In my world, the voices of menstruators are amplified, centered, and vital, not just for sanitation and water systems, but also for sustainable development. Sister of ocean and ten, I offer you this rocks, the foundation of my home. On our journey, make the same unshakable foundation, connect us, make us stronger. My sister, from one island to another, I give you these. As a reminder that our lives matter more than their power, that life in all forms demands the same respect we give to money, and that each and every one of us is affected by these issues. None of us is immune, and that each and every one of us has to decide if we will rise. We started as students, as strangers, and we stand before you now as sisters. Connected by individual stories and threatened by community, we use integration, the process of bringing our own unique selves to the work we do to co-create a joyful, inclusive, and resilient vision for the future. Our individual projects will demonstrate the integration of identities, equity, and culture for sustainable liberation. We hope that you will rise to the challenge of integrating your identity into whatever you aspire to do. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katia Gonzalez. Today I'll be presenting on developing sustainable and financial capita for the Frontera Land Alliance. But most importantly, I'll be telling a story of identity and integration. I was born in El Paso, Texas and raised in the borderland region. I grew up in a binational setting with two cultures, two languages, two traditions, and two legal systems. Trying to prove to my abuelita how Mexican I was, and then to my peers and friends at school, how American I was. So to say the least, it was challenging growing up with two of everything. However, it had its perks as well. 
growing up in the borderland region gave me the opportunity of being a first-gen American and a first-gen college student. To fast forward, I have to tell you that last summer I was pursuing a totally different MEM project, serving as a farm to school educator and living in Delta, Colorado. But MEA alumni and now my community sponsor, Andres Esparza, served as the bridge and helped me connect back with conservation work being done in my hometown. He introduced me to Frontera and its executive director. And after reflecting on the shared values I had with Frontera, right then and then, I knew deep down I wanted to contribute and amplify the work they were doing. So I decided to switch gears and dedicated my MEM project to serving Frontera and the El Paso community. Frontera is a nationally accredited nonprofit land trust organization that serves West Texas and the Southern New Mexico region. Frontera was established in 2004 by um, concerned community members wanting to protect the remaining open natural spaces in our region. But it wasn't until 2011 when Frontera hired its first executive director. And then it wasn't until this past fall when Frontera hired three new staff members, myself included. So as a development specialist, um, my role varies, but ultimately revolves around establishing secure funding. And most people tend, you can, you can go back, right? <laughs> thank you. Most people tend to see the development department as being money-based. I like to see it as being people-based. Genuine relationship building shouldn't have money as an end goal. Solid, healthy relationships with individuals, organizations, and institutions should be the gift in itself. So after immersing myself in my role and the organization mission, I learned that some of Frontera's challenges overlap with my responsibilities. So I created a management plan using the logic model. This logic model was introduced to me by the 611 class. And the reason why I use this logic model is because it serves as a roadmap to accomplish um, long-term goals. Therefore, I use the logic model to structure my management plan around it, but I focus my management plan on developing sustainable financial and social capital. The reason why I created this management plan it's because Frontera's strategic planning process started this year. So my management plan will help influence Frontera's board members and staff members discussion prior to the August meeting when the upcoming five-year strategic plan will be drafted. Okay, so some financial goals for Frontera in the upcoming years are to be less grant dependent, increase business sponsorship, donor retention, and donor membership. So the management plan is focused on best practices that aid in diversifying and securing um, funding. The most common ones are hosting fundraising events at local bookshop, breweries, and or coffee shops. Others can be done more virtually, like peer-to-peer -peer fundraising or crowdfunding. And then other practices for developing a greater financial capita are a system thinking approach for donor retention and finding creative ways to diversify the cultivation and stewardship practices. What's also essential is creating an individual management plan for each board member. So, it is clear that my position in development intersects with the social capita. And in fact, the social capita is vital to achieving Frontera's vision of community-based conservation, and it's key to achieve the organization mission. And in fact, 81% of the El Paso population is Hispanic. However, their participation with Frontera is almost non-existent. The youth is another audience that Frontera needs more engagement with. Frontera's sole mission is land conservation. Therefore, cultivating our future land stewards is extremely important, both for Frontera and for the region's natural areas. So Frontera is, finding, uh, is working on finding ways to make the outdoors more culturally relevant, inclusive, 
and attractive to new audiences, such as minorities and urban youth. So to address this need, I propose different initiatives in the management plan, such as setting informational booths at local parks where the Hispanic community is usually more present, offering outings at low-income communities where there's, a where there's a lack of access to open natural spaces, and then increasing our social media uh, presence and targeting our posts uh, for a younger audience. And then thirdly, establishing partnerships with the University of Texas at El Paso, El Paso Community College and other technical schools. And actually I started building relationships with the University of Texas at El Paso a few months ago when I reached out to different YouTube professors asking them if they wanted to participate in me giving a presentation to their students about Frontera. So I ended up doing five presentations and connected with over 80 plus students. Um, and at the end of each presentation, I saw a pattern. Most of the students didn't know about Frontera or the work that we do in our community. And of course, that the purpose of my visit was so that the students could learn about Frontera and the work that we do, but it was also to extend an invitation on a Frontera property hike to give the students an opportunity so that they could connect with place. However, only two students are SVP. But on the day of the event, 13 students showed up and it was such an impactful event, both personally and professionally. It reminded me that I too didn't grow up with outdoor recreation as the way to exist in the natural world. And this just highlights the important work that still lies ahead, both for Frontera and for the borderland region. Regardless, I was very grateful to share this experience with them. And my hope is that this marks the beginning to an intimate relationship to the outdoors for all of them. So to conclude, I can say that doing conservation work in other regions has been so great, but doing conservation work in my backyard has been so liberating and personal. I don't have to compartmentalize who I am. I can freely integrate my identity into the work I'm doing. Yes, I can be a conservationist, a scientist woman, and also an outdoor enthusiast, but also a Chicana and Fronteriza and a Latina. And that has empowered me significantly this last month and has taught me the importance of leading with your whole self. Thank you. I do wanna acknowledge my faculty mentor, Dr. Jess Young, for all of her guidance and inspiration in this journey. My uh, executive director, Fronteras ED, Jennifer Newfield, for all of her patience and kindness, Andres, my community sponsor, for all of his input and knowledge, my friends, uh, my MEM friends and faculty and other development specialists that also played a huge role, a huge role in me being here today. I thank you. And then lastly, shout out to my fellow first gens. I see you navigating life, your education and career all on your own, paving the way for others while still celebrating and honoring your cultura. Thank you. And now we have Antoinette presenting next. Questions first. <laughs> Yes, Josh. I think right now, since this is all very new to me and the development department, I am enjoying it a lot. And I just wanna see where this takes me and how I can keep connecting and not forgetting um, marginalized communities and kind of tie in together both the environment and the money sector, which kind of they seem that they're separate by social and financial capital are very interlinked. Thank you for your question.
Yeah, so Frontera right now, it's serving West Texas and Southern New Mexico. We have um, four properties that hold conservation easements, but the property is owned by the city and we only manage the conservation easement. We want, our mission is to conserve um, open natural spaces like ranches and farms, but we don't have um, a property where we hold a conservation easement with some of those stakeholders. Thank you for asking. Thank you, and we continue. Thank you, and Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Wow, can we give Katya another round of applause? That was amazing. <laughs> Wow, I'm in awe to be in this room to share this with extraordinary colleagues to hear amazing projects and to have supportive faculty here. Also on Zoom, hi. Um, <laughs> so um, I would like to thank all of you for being here this morning. Um, it is my honor to be on this stage to present to you all my Masters of Environmental Management project. My name is Anjanette Wilson. I'm a first generation college student and a first generation Filipino American. At these identities and at the intersection of these identities are challenges like defining what it means to be a Filipino mestiza. My MBM project not only addresses local food systems, but it also addresses how I've been able to reconnect with my Filipino culture. Before I begin, I just want everyone to know that talking about rep representation in predominantly white spaces is really hard for people of color. And I appreciate everyone here for not only listening, but hearing and afterwards taking these ideas and reflecting on them. And I just want everyone to know that we on this stage are groundbreaking here and making history right before your eyes. And I'm excited to share this all with you. I want to begin uh, by telling you my MEM project, but before I want to start off by telling you my story how I got here, what I accomplished, and what this all meant for me. One day, my MEM sister, Erin, invited me to go join the, the Posner Center's webinar on climate justice and indigenous rights. At this um, webinar, I actually got to hear from one panelist, Sherry Manning, who is the US Executive Director and founder of Global Seed Savers. Global Seed Savers is a nonprofit organization that advocates for food and seed sovereignty in the Philippines. And when I heard this, I, for the first time, had felt clear representation, clear representation of my culture and clear representation of my passion in environmental justice and environmental justice work against the backdrop of white environmentalism. <clears throat> you have to understand that these spaces here that we live in were not created for me. They were created in spite of me and they largely exist without me. So you can imagine how excited I was to hear about Global Seed Savers. <laughs> um, it's a space exclusively made for people like me to work in places where they can carry out work like Global Seed Savers. And the work of it is building a franchise in historically excluded communities of color. So after the webinar ended, Erin and I actually emailed Sherry and said, can we please have a coffee chat with you and just network? And Sherry with open arms had said yes and gave us her time and we made that happen. And organically I shared with Sherry my shared passions in environmental justice work. We also talked about sustainable food systems and protection and preservation of indigenous knowledge. And organically, I also shared my idea of what I wanted my MEM project to be, which was to launch a podcast that focused and amplified women's smallholder voices, especially farmers in the Philippines, on advocating and raising awareness on the Philippines and climate disasters and really going into the preservation of indigenous knowledge. And Sherry responded that she could see Global Seed Savers launching a podcast in the future. I was so excited to hear this. And she had pointed out though, that the work of the advocacy work in the Philippines is also powered by the operations and technical support of Global Seed Savers. 
In other words, they needed help in beefing up the operation and organizational groundwork game in order to build a capacity in order to host a podcast, like putting a cart before the horse. So I listened and I heard. I let go of what I wanted my MEM project to be. And I was guided by Global Seed Savers and Sherry in creating a project that was much needed and meaningful to them. Sherry and I decided that our collaboration would be a combination of environmental storytelling and operation support of the growing international nonprofit Global Seed Savers. And that's what we did. My MEM project was a seed and we planted it. Global Seed Savers' mission is to support smallholder farmers in, in creating local food sovereignty through technical training and establishing community owned seed libraries. And sovereignty is really about restoring the justice, restoring the power, and restoring the ownership of our food system to those that need to be our community leaders, which are our farmers. Smallholder farmers in the Philippines face social and environmental injustices like little to no government support for farming, forest dependency on chemical and synthetic seeds, and climate disasters like regular typhoons. In order to adapt to social and environmental changes like these, some farmers are forced to sacrifice the very legacy passed on to them by their parents and their lolas and lolos. One way to adapt to these changes without losing variety or history of our food system is through seed saving, just like our ancestors did. Seed saving that saving seeds that are regionally adapted and naturally produced is a climate solution. When you, when you save a seed that is grown in a certain environment, it is adapted to those environmental stressors, which inevitably and essentially creates climate resiliency. This is not a new practice. It's actually a traditional practice experienced by various indigenous peoples around the world. At Global Seed Savers, we partner with farmers that use traditional knowledge in saving seeds and in farming practices. The work at Global Seed Savers goes beyond seed saving. Seed saving is used as a way to help seed sovereignty by making seeds available to farmers. It preserves our Filipino culture and it's, it also preserves our traditional practices. This is how we can adapt to climate change while protecting our culture and identities. So I present to you my MEM project. Growing communities, saving seeds, nonprofit operations, and storytelling of seed sovereignty movements in the Philippines. My MEM for my MEM project, my objectives were to support the operations and technical side of Global Seed Savers, to work with the US Executive Director, Sherry, and to work closely with the communications and, man and marketing manager, Sarah. Remember that podcast I was talking about in chapter two? Well, we didn't get to launch that. Um, in this line of work, there were necessary shifts, and I was able to actually work on this as a passion project. And so I was able to develop a podcast framework that includes a 12-episode layout, future guest speakers, a budget, and more. But Sherry didn't want me to compartmentalize myself, and so we've accomplished many things together. But mainly, I've accomplished things like environmental visual storytelling, social media management and content creation and graphic design. I created this really cool infographic. <laughs> um, I also created uh, donor reports and impact reports as well as annual reports. But like I said, Sherry wanted me to grow and she, her transformative leadership had led me to water my MEM project and it branched out in many ways. We explored the other, other avenues where I can assist GSS like attending the Posner Center's decolonizing, decolonizing, decolonizing international development work. I gained experience in fundraising, and I also led our team in choosing our donor CRM tool for a better donor management, um, donor management system. The team here, Efren, Sherry, Harry, Sarah, and Karen, um, they opened, they invited me with the biggest hearts. They, despite being all virtual, they were so willing to teach me more about us and our culture. They taught me new words in our language. They taught me about my cultural, tradi cultural traditions and more. They shared with me our culture and they helped me learn about myself, my ancestors, and my history. 
I would even share with my mom some food dishes that I've never heard before. And she would tell me her childhood memories of making these dishes with her mom and dad, which are my Lola and Lolos. And so this project really became more about my history and my culture. And this is what made my project more meaningful and impactful. This MEM project was really more about a spiritual journey. It was about working with an organization that fostered a culture of representation. This experience has deepened my why, why I advocate for environmental justice, deepening my passion for integrating identity into climate action. Integrating my identity into my MEM project allowed me to fully immerse myself in things like environmental storytelling and taking action for the liberation of cultures that are threatened by environmental injustices. It is imperative that our culture, our culture and our identities and our ancestors are to be woven into environmental justice work. Justice to our farmers, justice to our communities and justice to our culture. So I end with hoping that I've inspired at least one of you here today to lean deeply into protecting traditional farming techniques and embody cultural liberation as a solution to climate change, regardless if it's your culture or not. This next part is less of a formal acknowledgement, but it's about me giving back gratitude to my community, and I couldn't have done it without you all. It is a testament to the guidance and encouragement and compassion from my Emmy and mentor, Jessica Young, my lifelong mentor. I hope I made you proud. Big, big thanks to Sherry Online <laughs> to, uh, for my community sponsor and the US Executive Director of Global Seed Savers. Your guidance and transformative leadership has shown me how I can integrate my identity into our work and what I'm capable of. Thank you to the GSS team, Harry, Karen, Sarah, Efren, and Karen. Thank you for leading me to reconnect to my culture in such a unique way. To my friends and family back at home who are also on Zoom, um, who have been there for me to listen to my hardships and prosperities. And lastly, my fiance, who's also taking pictures here as a photographer. Um, <laughs> thank you for your support. Your support has been more, and it goes beyond doing the dishes or making me my tasty Midnight Masters brain food, which is top ramen and trick cereal. <laughs> Thank you, I love you, and thank you all for listening and joining my community. Questions, please. So most of our work is actually based in the Philippines across um, multiple islands, but we are classified as two uh, nonprofits and our offices is in Denver. And we do a lot of engagement there with our partners, our supporters and everything, but most of our work is in the Philippines. We have one more question and please repeat the question. Oh. Yeah, so the question was requesting if I can talk more about the environmental uh, storytelling aspect of my project. I wish I had so much more time in this 12 minutes because I have so many things to share and a lot of tangible things. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of social media engagement, which required me to make videos. Some videos were to raise awareness on uh, regular typhoons that have hit our farmers and to raise more to raise support for them because their homes were destroyed and their farms were destroyed. And so I've made videos for that. Um, I made about four videos and I wish I could show them, but they're, they're quite, uh, they take a little bit of time into the 12 minutes, but yeah. And then within social media engagement, storytelling through posts so storytelling through reels and using that, but mainly leveraging social media. Thank you. And Sherry is telling you, good job, and Jeanette, we love having you in the GSS team and family. Oh, and thank you, Sherry. <laughs> and with this, we thank you to continue. 
And now I welcome to the stage my sister, M.E.M. Erin. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're tuning in to today. My name is Erin, and I'm excited to share with you all my project. To start, what does sustainability mean? And now, what does sustainability mean to you? I understand sustainability as an evolving theory and practice. It's a localized concept that varies from community to community, and it's not devoid of humans, and it's not a single issue struggle. As my fellow sisters have said, we are not your typical MEM students. Next slide, please. I am a female Filipina immigrant that came into this sustainability space from a background of global health. The intersection of my identities and experiences means that my approach to sustainability is influenced by communities, both people and their ecosystems all over the world. Sustainability for me is a care praxis, and I believe that the building a sustainable future for all requires the full potential of groups systematically marginalized by the dominant culture. Girls, women, non-binary, and transgender folks should not only participate in environmental and climate action, they should be given the space to lead. And the realization of that full potential depends on their health and also bodily autonomy. Which leads me to my next fine project, Dirt and Flower, an exploration of menstrual health management in three rural wardas of Amhara region. To start, my community sponsors from IDE deserve a shout out. Working with a global team passionate about menstrual health and gender equality from Elise in Denver to Martha in Addis Ababa has been a true joy. So what did we do? We used human-centered design or HCD to explore gaps and opportunities in menstrual health management in the new communities in which IDE worked. HCD is a research and design approach that helps put people at the center. It's got three phases. The create, the here phase is where you work to understand your question by talking to people directly impacted and not just talking, but building empathy. And then the create phase is where you ideate with all the stakeholders to find a relevant, affordable and desirable solution. And last, in the deliver phase, um, you actually try out your idea and fail or succeed, iteration within this phase is valued. In HCG, we use how might we statements, kind of like your research questions. So we asked, how might we expand our water, sanitation, and hygiene, or wash work to include menstrual health management, and how might we invest in women through a social enterprise model to deconstruct structural barriers in MHM. Because of our lack of funding with this work, we really chose to focus on the here phase, otherwise known as the empathy-led discovery process. It's also got three parts. Desk research, basically a literature review, and then we talked to external experts, which included researchers, entrepreneurs, and people in MHM adjacent spaces like gender equality, water and sanitation, and sexual and reproductive health. And then we took that information from the desk research and the external interviews to build an interview guide for local people. Um, between the three wardas and our study sites, we talked to around 100 menstruators and their families through interviews and focus group sessions. We're going further, what is menstrual health management? Well, menstrual health, the definition, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity in relation to the menstrual cycle. This means that a menstruator's journey is complex 
and nuance. And it's not just about access to products. It's also the privacy and space of latrines and bathrooms. It's the menstrual knowledge and education and it's policies, systems, and social norms. So talking to menstruators, what we learn about how they manage their cycles and how they feel about it. This project is called Dirt and Flower because those are two actual names used in Ethiopia to reference menstruation. And it's also a testament to how attitudes about MHM vary dramatically. People interviewed had expressed a range of beliefs from stigma to shame to acceptance and normalization, both personally and culturally. And with minimal education around menstruation in schools and health centers and their pervasive silence about menstruation, many young menstruators often felt unprepared at Menarch, their first time menstruating. And they said that they felt sick, frightened, shocked, ashamed, afraid, and panicked. And that these feelings persisted even for older menstruators. Menarche was often perceived to link to sexual activity, which made parents more concerned about preventing unwanted pregnancies than helping children navigate menstruation for the first time. And so contraceptive use was also really high in these wardas. Interviewees said that menstrual related social exclusion was common. For example, menstruators can't enter church compounds. They decrease their eating and bathing habits. They limit their travel, work, and school attendance while menstruating. In these wardas, these beliefs were largely linked to the Orthodox Church, where biblical stories recount how Adam and Eve ate the apple and led to the sin or curse of menstruation. Between generations, MHM needs and views vary. Younger menstruators prefer menstrual pads and know more about menstruation because of school and are more willing to discuss it than older menstruators who prefer to use cloths or no products at all and are less likely to know information and openly discuss menstruation. Linkages are clear between water and sanitation and MHM. Latrine design aspects like proximity to water and soap, lights, locks, waste baskets, and superstructures um, influence latrine use during menstruation because they can help or hinder safe product use and disposal. And then Rural supply chains are really bad for menstrual products. Pads, especially rural reusable ones, are hard to come by. Um, but menstruators said that they would like to have access to them. Instead of the normal ideation phase of the create ses or session, um, we chose to focus on sharing our work internally and externally. Martha and I presented at the 2022 CU WASH Symposium then how we and I presented to IDE peers at a global WASH learning collaborative. The word cloud you see there about menstrual choice is from part one and part two will actually be a co-creation session later this year. We chose to wait to do our ideation session because of our lack of funding. Um, think of what I'm presenting to you today as our feasibility study to prove that menstrual health could be incorporated into IDEs water and sanitation program. And we're excited to continue this work with an internal grant that will allow us to do a new deep dive in a new WARDA and pilot a small scale study in early 2023. Politically and with COVID, going to Ethiopia was really difficult. So thanks to the Haley family and Sarar, I had the opportunity to go to Me Mexico. Throughout my project, I craved being in community again and knew that it was an important aspect of my project and also a great source of inspiration for me. And it really taught me about the importance of culture in a social taboo topic like menstruation. Both IDE and Sarar taught me the importance of meaningful community development not just what it was, but how to do it through the Sarar methodology or human-centered design. This is crucial because I'm not from Mexico or Ethiopia. So learning how to amplify and center others in my work was a primary project goal. This ties into sustainability because care and community 
are vital to our human needs. Um, when mainstream sustainability initiatives focus on only single issues, they can create more poverty, like safety, security, friendship, and effective problem solving and more, because those generating the solutions are often not from the communities experiencing these poverties. Sustainability as a care praxis is achieved through a foundation of respect, unity, and accountability to each other, other communities, and the environment. Whitney McGuire's liberatory stance is one that I subscribe to, and she says, I refuse to live a life that is not rooted in liberation and care. And I'm grateful that the projects I've been allowed to do have allowed me to weave culture, equity, and joy in everything I do. And it could not have happened without the care and support of new and familiar friends along the way, like Paloma, Rafa, and Ron, and Samira from Sarar, Soko and her entire family, Andrea, Kristen, and Erin, and my cohort of amazing global sustainability scholars, Sally, Miriam, and Chaz, and the rest of the Multicultural Center for making Western feel and taste all the better, Dr. Vasquez Perales for your amazing connections, and lastly, Jess. Thank you for seeing, listening, and nurturing my whole identity. I couldn't have done all the cool things without you. I want to be honest. I started and applied for this IDE internship almost two years ago from a place of fear and inadequacy. I didn't think that I knew enough about sustainability or environmental management because I didn't see myself my interests and my experiences reflected in what we were learning. I thought that the gateway of HCD applied to water and sanitation was environmental enough, right? So to others feeling those same feelings right now, especially my Black, Latinx, Asian, and first-generation friends, your feelings are valid. And you're right, these spaces are not meant for us. And yet I hope you go into them anyways, and you bring your whole identity, your joy, and most importantly, your friends along with you in the way. You'll be surprised what you can achieve through integration and care. And I'll close with the same question I started with today. What does sustainability mean to you? Great, Erin. And we have a space for Questions, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Repeat the question, please. How did I build trust with interviewees, especially with a taboo topic? Um, and I would say that this is not my place. Um, and I only helped create um, a really well-crafted interview guide. And I created a best practices guide of how others had done interviews with such a social taboo topic. And we trialed that um, interview with lots of people. And then I worked with Martha, our wash manager in Ethiopia, as well as Howie, our gender equity and social inclusion manager to ensure that that interview was really well crafted. And then they worked with their team and developed that and talked to the over 100 menstruators.
yeah. So the question was talking about all of the range of experiences with menstruation. Um, and you're absolutely right. I think one of the cool parts about this project is also sad, is how new everything is and how things are constantly developing. And people are only starting to study menstrual pain right now. Um, and so it's really hard to discuss all of that right now. Um, I think the big thing that's different about Ethiopia and these places that we worked in um, was the high use of contraceptives, which kind of minimize people's menstrual pain as well as their flow. Um, and that was really an unexpected finding within our interviews um, and is something that we're really excited to delve into in the new waradas. So we're going to talk again to menstruators before we actually pilot any sort of study. And we'll definitely include more questions about pain and family planning, contraceptive use, as well as waste and all of those aspects. Thank you, Arun. Um, please invite your friends to come. Your sisters. Let's go, friends. Yeah, we will begin with a comment here from Elise Mann and says, the pleasure has been all mine. IDE is so lucky to have you work with you throughout the evolution of your project. And we are glad to keep supporting you and cheering you on as you dive into your next chapter. Thanks, Elise. Eli is asking, what was my experience? What was my experience changing projects? Um, I don't know how I even began to explain that, but um, my experience, hope I hope it helps um, our fellow first years MEMers just to go with your heart and your values. Uh, my first project was about food insecurity in Delta County. And I liked that uh, project a lot, but when I went to Frontera and just, it resonated with my heart and my values and it was my community. So I don't think there was a question. I just went for it, but it was a very cool and complex experience, Eli. <laughs> Thank you for asking. That question. Uh, the question was, can we flag any barriers that com that comes with our identities and going into sustainability, more or less? <laughs> um, there are a lot of barriers, especially being a first generation college student. And I will just speak for myself because each and every one of us has our own experience. But I didn't even know how to apply to school, and so I didn't I didn't know how a mentor or a mentee relationship should have gone or. I didn't know how to reach out to a community sponsor in a way that is professional, but not professional. Um, so that was really hard to navigate for me, but being a first generation Filipino American is similar to what Katya's experience was, was that all my life, I've always wondered if I'm Filipino enough or if I'm white enough. And so though navigating that in academia is super hard because imposter syndrome is dominant. Even presenting on this stage, imposter syndrome crept up and was like, should you be here or should you not? So those still happen. And I think coping with them is realizing that these spaces we're creating for ourselves and these barriers are only making us stronger and more powerful. 
Um, I think my only thing to add on to that is working with lots of international projects, um, understanding that work culture and language is really important in all of these spaces. And I only speak Spanish and English, and I don't speak Amharic or the other many languages of Ethiopia. Um, and so I think letting others lead uh, would probably be a good space to start in terms of navigating those barriers. And from Gigi movement to Antoinette, will you work in Philippines? 100%. I, my family goes back every four years to help support my family over there that lives um, in a village, but going back there has always been my home. And so working over there would just be another cherry on top. <laughs> Yes. So Chloe wants to know about the gifts. <laughs> um, so based on her poem, when we introduced, um, I'll bring my home to yours. We each brought a piece of our home. So I brought a prickly pear cactus from the Chihuahuan Desert. I had another MEM sister help me out, Emily. I actually forgot my seeds back at home. And so I leveraged my support group to get some beans to also represent local food as well. And Food sovereignty here in the getting. <laughs> Mine wasn't necessarily from my home. It was just a part of my project and I brought a reusable pen. Yeah. Um, I would say that leveraging your existing- Can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, how would you begin to work in global sustainability and any advice for that? Um, and I would say that leveraging your existing network is really important. Um, what Anjanette hasn't shared yet about Sherry is that she's actually a returned Peace Corps volunteer and I already knew of and was a part of the Posner Center and so both IDE and Global Seed Savers work through the Posner Center. And so being able to leverage those existing networks and make connection that way was really important. I would also add that I'm a distance student and I did my project completely all online. And so I really leveraged virtual relationships and making community through the virtual world in a different way. And I think that entering in, you know, from COVID and then now all of us are here in person, thankfully, but I had really leveraged the online world and that helps make global connections for me, but also my projects, like I said, joining the Posner Center's webinar had changed practically my whole life. And I think making that network and like, it sounds so silly to ask someone for a coffee chat, but that's really all it takes to make those connections. It just takes one conversation about a passion or some desire about global sustainability and it just takes off. Yeah, um, initially our idea was to only focus on reusable pads and set up some sort of like local production system um, because 99% of Ethiopia's menstrual product supply chain is currently imported and then only that is really concentrated in urban areas. But working in this project and especially talking to the external experts they really imparted to me the importance of informed choice. Um, and this is a, 
an idea, not just in menstrual um, health management, but also with sexual and reproductive health, kind of with like abortions and contraceptives, the idea of presenting choices to people and allowing them to choose is really important. And I think especially in places like rural Ethiopia, without kind of like the water and sanitation and the disposal systems already set up, only pushing reusable pads is actually really dangerous. How do they safely like wash and dry those things? And so I think our biggest focus is really building the supply chain and getting people the options and the education they need. Following that one, would it be possible to train or teach the older women to use sanitary products? From Gigi um, I don't know. This was the part that I really struggled in was pushing products that people didn't want or necessarily need. Um, and I, I think it's more sustainable to let people free bleed if they want to free bleed. Um, and I think it's really about what they taught me um, in those external interviews was asking, can people participate in the way that they want socially? And at the moment, menstruation can really hinder that. Um, and I think that's what we're going to be focusing on rather than making people use products. And we have comments from the distance audience. Great job. Love all these presentations and each of you taking the courage, the courageous step to call out these wide spaces and build new open doors for you and for your fellow BIPOC environmental leaders. Thank you. Yeah. We have more comments. Yes, Dylan. Yeah, so the question was if in the Philippines we focused on plant saving. Um, saving seeds inevitably saves plants and what our farmers and some of them do identify as indigenous are saving plants that have been there for generations and part of our culture. Um, some bean varieties have been there for our, you know, multitude of years and we're now focusing on projects. At Global Seed Savers, we are partnering and have a lot of collaborations going on at the moment, which is really exciting, but we are focusing on kind of doing more plant research and stuff like that through our co collaborations. But really with our seed saving, the, the practice of it is traditional and it's indigenous and the plants that we're saving the seeds from are also indigenous and native to the area. And that just preserves all of it, the environment that goes with that, the soil, it's all organic, so we focus on organic saving seeds. So that specifically goes into the biodiversity and plant uh, preservation. So I hope that that answered your question. Okay. <laughs> Great, and to close this panel, I just want to read loudly the comment from Dr. John, John Hausdorfer. Just a thank you from Dr. John, the most courageous, humbling, and wholehearted panel. I have witnesses, witnessed it in my MEN career. Thank you. I'm gonna ask for one more round of applause so that next time any one of these amazing individuals thinks and wonders whether they should be here, that they first thing that they hear and see is all of you cheering for them and assuring them that they truly are masters of environmental management. And now I'm going to ask you to rise and congratulate Aaron Mercado. Katia Gonzalez and Anjanette Wilson 
on becoming masters of environmental management. Congratulations. And after lunch, we hope you'll stay for the next panel, Navigating Landscapes Using Dana, Data and Strategic Planning with Catherine, Chloe, and Josh. Thank you.